You heard of the Dung Eater? He's a madman. Has it out for everyone. Curses him. Goes round in his rank armor and all. You see him, though. Stay. Well, away. I was in the same jail as him once, so I know first hand. He's a god-forsaken monster. Not just some petty dog like me. The Dunk Eater. Easily one of the most hated beings in the land between. Not just in game, but in real life discussions. In this video, I will explain what is the metaphorical significance behind Dunk Eater's ending. And it's probably not what you think. It's not just cursing all people because of hatred. And it's not even as simple as popular opinion. If everyone is omen, then no one is omen. It's something more deeper and even more optimistic. The video will have six different sections. The first section – quick recap why evolution is a bad thing. The second section will be about how Golden Order tried to solve this problem – the first solution. In the third section we will talk about the second possible solution to the evolution problem – the medical solution. In the fourth section I will try to convince you that the Dunk Eater's actions were driven by good intentions, that he was a good person, after all. In the fifth section we will talk about what Dunk Eater's ending means, using only in-game logic. The main topic – the sixth section – metaphorical significance of Dunk Eater's ending. How does it present to us the third solution to our unsolved evolution problem? This video serves as the second installment of a two-part series on the Dunk Eater lore. The first video focused entirely on evolution, and I recommend watching it first for full context. However, I will provide a brief recap here to ensure this video can also stand alone effectively. Evolution has two aspects. Trial aspect which is natural selection. In Elden Ring, the Crucible serves as a metaphor for this concept. The second is the chaos aspect, the random mutations that contribute to diversity in life. In Elden Ring, Omen symbolizes this random mutation, but more specifically, the bad ones, the mutation which lead to disadvantages, the bad genes, which can be transferred by blood. For simplicity, you can think of it as an illnesses. And why is evolution problematic? Because natural selection no longer operates as it once did. Today, virtually anyone can survive and reproduce, regardless of genetic disadvantages. This means people with hereditary illnesses, poor eyesight or weak immune system can live normal lives and help children who pass these genes to subsequent generations. As our medical capability advance, this least optimal genes will be passed throughout humanity. It is only natural that the Order rejects the chaotic nature of evolution due to their incompatible nature. Of course, this has been a simplified explanation. If you are still skeptical or interested in more detailed information, I encourage you to watch the first part of this series. Natural selection is not working anymore due to the order influence. Today, even these with weaker genetic traits can survive and reproduce, passing their genes on the future generation. But the golden order, as always, made things even worse, way worse. By the law of nature, the weak perish and the strong survive. But this no longer holds. Even if someone is born extremely ill, he will survive. Literally everyone is immortal now. Everyone survives. Consequently, every gene, regardless of its detrimental quality, is passed on to the next generation. This is a real problem. People after 5000 years will be even weaker. So what the solution? It's quite straightforward. If natural selection is no longer effective, why not implement artificial selection? If nature can't prevent individuals with detrimental traits from reproducing, 
Perhaps it's something we need to manage ourselves. We don't like Omen? Just kill them. Just put them underground for rot for eternity. Brilliant, right? Omen killers didn't kill Omens because they enjoyed it or wanted it. Omen killer Rolo. Once a famous performer, Rolo, invited a physics to rid himself of emotion, thus enabling him to enact his nightmarish labor, hunting the Omen. As he was once a famous performer, he had everything, money and fame. The decision of rid of emotion implies that he feels regret. He didn't want to kill Omens, but he has to do it. It was a mission. He truly believed it was the right thing to do. Maybe that was even a direct order from the Golden Order, a mission to purify our species. But the plan ultimately failed. Due to the mess caused by shattering, Omens were able to escape the shining grounds of Leyendel. I have a lot more to say about other implications of why the Golden Order hunts Omen, but I already did it in another video. You can watch it if it seems interesting. To truly understand what I mean by artificial selection, I can give an example from other media. Marshall. New anime based on Shonen Jump manga. In that world, every single person is a magic user. To reach this state, in the distant past, all non-magic users were eradicated. Whenever a non-magic user is born, the government executes them to maintain the status quo. Now only magic users remain. Thus, a world in which everybody can use magic begins. That's what artificial selection is and what results it can produce. This is the most peaceful solution, the solution which is used in the real world. If omens are like people with diseases, then why don't cure them? From performer Tricia Ashes. Tricia was once known as healer who dedicated her efforts to treating his begotten. Omen and all this seem as impure. So Tricia attempted to cure the pure omens. And not only famous Tricia but other performers followed his examples. From performers traveling garb, an associate of a healer, he is said to be in search of new aromatics and flower garden, in hopes of treating misbegotten, omens and all this seen as impure. But they all ultimately failed, as the medical knowledge in the lands between is quite limited, which is understandable. Based on the blessed Dew talisman, we can see that people were healed simply by being near the earth tree. There was no real need for doctors during the earth tree's time. Furthermore, after the earth tree era ended and the age of the golden order began, the motivation for medical research weakened even more. With people now immortal, what need is there for cure? In the real world things are simpler. For every blind person there are glasses that they can put on. For every curse there is a blessing. So even if the genes that makes you blind will succeed, it really doesn't matter. It's not even a problem anymore. That's the beauty of medicine and civilization. An interesting observation. When we defeat Margot, he lacks horns, a tail and scales. None of the typical crucible traits. I don't know yet what it signifies, but maybe it is curable after all. With every mention of the Dunk Eater, game describes him in negative light, as a villain. His actions are portrayed as cursed, loathsome, dangerous and utterly evil. He's a god-forsaken monster. He's a killer. Kills people. And curses the souls. Does all sorts of shit to the corpses. To keep them cursed forever. I ain't seen nothing more disgusting in all my years. He's back, the Dung Eater, again. I can even hear the repulsive twisted malice in itself. Even the trailer narrator. The loathsome Dung Eater. The reviled curse that defies.
find our age. The item descriptions also follow the trends. The Dunk Eater cultivates the seedbed curse on corpses, one of the most loathsome things found in the lands between. His name in Japanese, Kusokui, is literally a slur. The ghost in Kaslomona describes him as disgraceful. Even the key, just an ordinary key, is described as filthy key received from the Dunk Eater. The game really really wants to create an impression that the Dunk Eater has only one bad side, to curse and kill everyone. But who defines what a curse is? Just because someone is labeled negatively doesn't mean they are inherently evil. The definition of curse and sins are established by the gods. And in Elden Ring, the gods are, let's say, not the most reliable source. Misbegotten were once considered divine, but as civilization advanced, now they became no more than cursed beings. It is a recurring theme in Souls game. Recall Dark Souls 1, where humans were led to believe that Halloween was a bad thing, and the curse of undead was to be feared, because gods just fear the true form of humans. And in dire fear of humans, so that you may link the fire, cast away the dark, and undo the curse of the undead. On the other side, what evidence suggests that Dan Kitter might actually be a good guy? The first clue is presented at the very beginning of the game. Dunk Eater is mentioned alongside tarnished heroes such as Egidion and Horalu. I believe that the grace extended to the Tarnished was specifically granted by Marika. There is substantial evidence supporting this theory, but it's not the focus of our current discussion. I am planning to explore the metaphorical meaning of grace in an upcoming video, so please stay subscribed. <laughs> please. <laughs> so then why did Marika extend grace to Dan Kitter? He clearly had a bad reputation back then as you can see from this image. Maybe because Marika knew that person is not always defined by his reputation alone. Maybe because he wasn't that bad after all. The second evidence comes from Dunk Eater's Omen armor. Worn by the Dunk Eater, the heavy, sun-shaped medallion represents both the guidance he once saw and the ring to which it will one day lead. That confirms that Dunk Eater's final goal is to establish his own order. I can hear in the Malison another fearsome order. And judging by the sun-shaped medallion on his armor, his order is in line with Grace. He wearing a sun, which represents Grace, which Marika granted to him. So he must be a devoted follower of the current order. He truly believes that what he is doing is the what guidance of grace want him to do. And it's specified that the sun is heavy. It means this burden is really heavy for Dunk Eater. He didn't enjoy it. And didn't really want to do it. He has to do it. Also Melina. She is caring about the future of the lands between. If he attempts to engage with the Three Fingers and unleash the Flame of Frenzy, she will kindly ask us to stop. A pity. You are no longer fit. Should you rise as the Lord of Chaos, I will kill you. As sure as night follows day. And if the Dunk Eater's ending is as bad as people think, why did Melina not say a single word about it? Because she is perfectly fine with that new order. She knows what it implies. The third piece of evidence supporting Dunk Eater's good intention can be found in his dialogues, where he frequently refers to a curse as a blessing. You warded off my blessing. Despite the curse, the must receive the blessing. Give me your blessing. Defile. 
and bless in my stead. A curse blesses to And this isn't merely his delusion. The narrator says at the end. The next generation will see the outcome of the Dunk Eater's ending as a blessing. So there are definitely some positives in him. And the fourth evidence. It is really circumstantial, but think about it. At the end of the Dunk Eater's quest, he asks us to kill him and defile his body. Give me your blessing. Defile my flesh with the seed bed curse. Again and again. Until it is done. Until a cursed ring coalesces, and my one day defile order itself. He was ready to die for his ambitions. That fact alone is indeed admirable. Everyone who is ready to die for their goal deserves praises. And yes, the process of defilement is really painful. But he endured that pain not once, not twice, but five times. To create Maiden Kroon we need to defile his flesh five times. And if we kill him without torturing and defilement, he would die in despair, as evident in Dunk Eater Puppet. The Dunk Eater despaired at how he met his end, how hideous and sinister this puppet is, and yet its utter despair invites one to care for it. The Dunk Eater's Ending First, we need to understand what his order means using in-game logic. He is trying to curse as many people as he can. And his other goal is to create another being like Dunk Eater, who will continue his deeds. Countless I have killed, and countless I have defiled, and soon the fruits will be born, hundreds will be reborn cursed and they'll bear thousands of cursed children, who bear tens of thousands more. A few of those will be born just like me, and they'll kill and defile and bless in my stead. And about the curse nature, from Mendin Krun of the Fell Curse, Lawsum Rune, gestated by the Dunk Eater, used to restore the fractured Elden Ring when brandished by the Elden Lord. The reviled curse will last eternally, and the world's children, grandchildren, and every generation hence will be its pistolas. If order is defiled entirely, defilement is defilement no more, and for every curse, a cursed blessing. That means no need to torture people anymore to curse them. Instead of defiling individuals one by one, we can defile the order itself. Judging from the heart's design, the curse in question is Omen's curse. And because a curse is defined by gods, that means curse, which spreading by Elden Ring, is not a curse at all. It's now a blessing, even if the only thing that changed it was a perspective. And from Seedbed Curse. By cursing people, Dunk Eater prevents dead souls returning to the Earth Tree, leaving them forever cursed one of the most awesome things found in the lands between. Dead people now will not return to the earth tree. By the way, common misconception. It does not mean that people will be eternally wandering as cursed soul unable to return. People still can be reborn. Hundreds will be reborn cursed. So people can be reborn without earth tree influence. And isn't that a good thing? It's pretty much a community headcanon that L3 or Elden Beast sucking vital energy from people reincarnating. Or it gives other benefits to greater will through our struggle, as many theorize. So even this aspect could be considered as good, depending on your perspective.
We are working with three assumptions here. The crucible symbolizes evolution. Omens embody negative random changes from evolution or diseases. And crucially, Dunk Eater's motive carry no ill intent. He aimed to accomplish something beneficial. The core idea of Dunk Eater's ending is that everyone will become an omen. But something odd, something really strange lies in Omen Helm description. Malformed Helm, resembling an omen with eight horns cut off, worn by the Dunk Eater. Their form is a vision of the landscape of his mind and of his appearance as he wished to see it. The heart of an omen without the body too much. Could there be any cruel existence? What does it matter then, if the course claims it all? Isn't that contradicting? Dunk Eater wants to become like Omen. But his armor, the appearance he wished to see, looks like Omen with his horns cut. Why? Omen are defined by horns, and he wants specifically to be like Omen with horns amputated. So what is the third solution to our evolution problem? What is the metaphorical meaning of Dunk Eater's ending? I think his ultimate goal is to overcome Omen's disease. His armors tell us that he wanted to be born Omen, but cut horns tell us that he doesn't want to live like Omen. So I truly believe that the whole point of Dunk Eater's quest is to return the natural evolution into in-game world, which help us to overcome the Omen disease. Let's see his dialogue in that context. That when they're reborn, they'll be cursed, along with their children and their children's children, for all time to come. These lines indicate that he wants to create as many random mutations as possible, as much life diversity as it could be. But something interesting comes after. Those will be born just like me, and they'll kill, and defile, and bless in my stead. Among those who will be omen, few will be born like Dunk Eater, and we know he sees himself as omen with cut horns, so there would be people who are omens but born without horns. A similar analogy would be antidotes. To overcome poison, Often one should endure it and survive the dose. Without tasting the poison, you will never get the antidote for it. A very interesting piece of lore and possible Dark Eater's motivation lies in Sword of Milos. Sinister great sword, fashioned from a giant's backbone. Milos was undersized for a giant, and was viewed as sealed and terribly grotesque. I believe this is the answer to why the Dark Eater become like this. Why he is so focused on evolution? Because he saw it. He saw the results of the broken current state of evolution right now. The once dangerous, almost godlike giants, and now undersized, grotesque, pathetic undersized giant, which was Milos. Dan Kitter saw that. Everyone becomes weaker over time. There is no salvation from it. In the future, our seeds will be even weaker than we are. So maybe, maybe if we bring back the evolution, maybe we could avoid such a horrible fate in the future. I think Tank Eater thought with something like that. And finally, what is the blessing of despair that narrators tell us? I think this is pretty simple. The fallen leaves tell a story of how a tarnished became Elden Lord, in our home, across the fog, the lands between, our seed will look back upon us and recall the reviled curse that defined our age, the blessing of despair. I interpret these words as 
in the future people will remember our age as not really good days. But that course, that despair which we endure will lead us to blessing. People in the future will be stronger. They will evolve. By our despair, our seeds will receive blessing. A similar concept appears in the story of Cold Vein. There is a red mist in the world, serving as a barrier that protects humanity from formidable creatures lurking beyond. The main antagonist is Mido. His goal is to get rid of that red mist. He argues that exposing humanity to this danger would serve as a catalyst for our ultimate evolution. In the harsher environment, only the strongest could survive and reproduce, potentially accelerating human development. Only, of course, if humanity will be able to withstand the danger of the new world. It's not really the same as Dunkiters, but ultimately their goal is the same. The only difference is that Mido chose to control outside factors, like the environment, and the Dunk Eater chose to control the inside factor, the forceful mutations. Thank you all for sticking with me throughout this deep dive into the Dunk Theater character. I wanted to keep things as simple as possible and originally envisioned wrapping this theory up in about 30 minutes. But as you seen, it's taken us two videos and over an hour to explore these concepts. Even though I left out a lot. My apologies for the extended discourse, but I hope you find the journey worth the extra time. I must extend a special thanks for Crunchy and Ratatoskar. It was during their stream they discussed the concept of the crucible as evolution. After a lot of thinking, I came up with this theory. Their insights have been invaluable in shaping this exploration. Now, I am eager to hear your thoughts on this topic. Do you agree with these interpretations presented, or do you see things differently? Please leave your comments below. I am looking forward to reading your perspective and engaging in some fascinating discussions. Looking ahead, the next video will be released around the 12th or 13th of June. Just in time for the upcoming DLC, we'll be exploring the Shadowlands theory, and you don't want to miss it. So if you haven't already, please subscribe to stay updated with all the latest content. Once again, thank you for your time and attention. Your support means the world to me, and I am excited to continue this journey with you all. Until next time, keep questioning, keep theorizing, and as always, Keep exploring the depths of the lore we have yet to fully understand.